this episode of In Focus, I'm joined by Nerida Connorsby, the Chief Economist at the REA Group. Welcome, Nerida. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, if anyone doesn't know who the REA Group is, then where have you been? Because obviously they own the realestate.com.au brand and also Smartline, which is the mortgage broking business for REA Group. And you're uh, the Chief Economist for the whole group. Um, so, and one of the most quoted economists, I think, in Australia, even during lockdown, you've been on all these videos and webinars and um, on TV talking about the state of the economy. And we'd love to pick your brain today about that further. Before we do, though, let's talk about how you got to where you are now, because obviously as chief economist, that's a big undertaking, a big role. How did you start off that way? Yeah, I, um, I studied economics at uni and um, I graduated in the early 90s and there wasn't many jobs around. So at that time, I had three options. I could go work for government. I could go to Canberra and go work for Department of Transport. Uh, my second option was going to work for a bank in, in one of their graduate programs. And the third option was going to work for an economic consulting firm that specialised in property. Uh, so I took the third option. I got to stay in Melbourne at the time. And, um, and, I, and it was interesting because I, I didn't know much about property at that time. You know, I'd been very focused on, I was very focused on um, econometrics, on statistics. Uh, I was doing a lot of work with household, household expenditure data. And fun. <laughs> yeah, and the, you know, I kind of felt that was good and that was kind of my path. And I got into property and, um, and just loved it. Like, it, oh, I do still love it. I just love it. And the um, main reason being, so many interesting people, you know, it's, it's a very um, personality driven business and, um, and also so many interesting trends as well. And the fact that Australians have, are so property obsessed uh, does give me lots of things to talk about and lots of people to talk to. So how has the environment changed since you first started in this role? Uh, I guess the main thing has been uh, the rapid change in data usage. You know, the, when I started, we were still doing dots on maps to try and work out where buyers were coming from. Um, but also the number of women in the industry. And I know when I was in my in my 20s and I was in the property industry and I, I was looking for female role models and uh, there just weren't many around. You know, there was, uh, you know, I couldn't even find any in, in the industry, in the consulting industry I was in at the time. So one of the really good things has just been the number of women that have come through and come through very much on the residential side. You know, we've, we've got a lot more female agents out there. Uh, we've got a lot more brokers coming through. So working on the finance side, uh, commercial property slowly but surely is, is starting to see more women. So uh, it is a big change, but it does create op opportunity and it does also allow companies to get access to a greater pool of talent. And I think that's fundamentally what more women in the industry provides is, is just greater talent out there. Yeah, for sure. And I know that Smartline has been very active in this area. They've got the Future of Females project going on at the moment, trying to recruit more women into broking because, as you say, it's, you know, finance traditionally very male dominated. I think the stats from the MFAA sort of suggest that around a third of the brokers or less than a third of brokers are women, which is surprising given the fact that in a lot of households, women are the decision makers and they're the ones that actually, you know, sign the mortgage in the end and make the decision. So I think it's always interesting to see that there isn't that sort of reflection from who the customer is to who the professional advising them is. So great to see so much work going on and trying to bring more women into the industry and just create a more sort of diverse and a more balanced workforce. Yeah, a balanced workforce is, is great. Um, so as a chief economist, you must be extremely busy at the moment. So obviously the main thing that everyone has been focused on is how the economy has been changing during the social distancing um, requirements brought about because of the coronavirus, COVID-19. I just wonder before COVID really hit Australia. So let's say around sort of, you know, November, December time last year, what were your sort of predictions for what the economy would look like in 2020? Uh, very positive. Yeah, I think, um, that, you know, there wasn't any, no one really was predicting a massive fallout at the time uh, in terms of what would happen as a result of, result of COVID-19. And even to the extent that I was at a, a press club lunch where the Reserve Bank Governor was talking in February and um, he was asked his thoughts on, on COVID-19 and, and he was saying, oh, you know, at this stage, it doesn't look like it's a problem. And, uh, and very rapidly what we found through early March was, yes, this is a, a massive problem. And, um, and by early March, we were all shut down and, and all working from home. And we'd seen massive disruptions to certain industries. And, um, and it, was a, you know, it was a shock, you know, it was certainly a shock to the economy and it was a shock to a lot of people. For sure. And I think, as, you know, as we said, like, you know, January, February, the economy, and the, the home loans that were being written were still very sort of high. 
Even recently, we've seen stats from ABS suggesting that in March, loans were, again, very, very high. Um, and obviously, as March continued into April, there was the huge sort of change with um, auctions being no longer allowed to be held in person, um, having everyone having to rapidly change to a digital environment when they were working. I wonder, given now that we're in sort of, you know, still social distancing requirements, but hopefully moving into a bit more of easing, what your sort of predictions are for the economy and really particularly the property market for the rest of the year? So, yeah, I mean, you're right. It, it was a, an interesting time early on. And, and March data that came through is still looking really positive. Um, what we found on realestate.com.au was that first two weeks of lockdown, it was just this massive fallout in terms of search, um, in, in terms of views per listing. You know, every every data point we were looking at in those early, early two weeks were, were quite catastrophic. I think a lot of things have helped. I mean, we, we have seen very low levels of infection and I think this is something that uh, will put Australia in a much better place than many other parts of the world, that we haven't been hit by these incredible rates of death and um, and also the, the I guess, the shock to, to you know, people's um, lives hasn't been so great. Uh, but the other thing that will help is the, the enormous amount of money that's been poured into the economy. We've had 16.4% worth of GDP, worth of stimulus, which is helping now and it will help um, really cushion the blow in terms of how bad things will get. Uh, and also we've got a, a relatively stable banking system and I think this is a real key compared to previous downturns. If you have a look back to the early 90s, we did have a, um, a finan financial sector that was, was you know, going under. I mean, Westpac nearly went under at the time based on some loans that they'd made to commercial property developers. Uh, go to the global financial crisis, mid 2000s, and you know, we similarly had a real restriction on finance. And this time, we don't have such a restriction on finance. And, uh, and so it makes it very different that we've got this productivity problem that we can't work properly, but um, the finance sector is still pretty stable. And, and you know, I think, and hopefully we get through this with a continuous need stability in the, in the finance sector. So I think going forward, I mean, there's a few things that um, will happen. I mean, we, we will get back to work. And, you know, I think as we gradually get back to work, that will start to improve unemployment, obviously. It will improve our confidence. You know, I think a lot of us are feeling pretty miserable at the moment. And, you know, we don't quite know what's going to happen to our jobs. We don't know what's going to happen to, you know, our, our families' jobs. Even if you've got kids at school, it's very stressful day to day having them at home. So, you know, there's a lot of stress around. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we all get, I mean, hopefully, but, you know, things are easing up and more of us will get back to work. So that will really help. Uh, I think the thing, though, it won't be back to normal straight away, you know, and, I, and if you have a look at what's happening in China at the moment, there are some sectors of the economy that are doing better and people are, you know, they are slowly getting back to work, but people are still very nervous about being in crowds. Uh, if you go out to dinner, you know, restaurants are still quite quiet because people are a little bit nervous about being close to each other. Mm. Uh, we're still going to have a shutdown on global uh, tra um, tourism international students, you know, there's all these things that will be quite different for a, a lot longer until we either get a vaccine or, you know, we work out a way to manage COVID infections um, in, in an environment where we've been largely not hit as much as other parts of the world. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, just looking at um, sort of housing and property, I mean, we've been seeing, as I said, sort of up until, you know, really the lockdown period, everything going gangbusters really you know we had all the major banks offering these huge cashback refinance offers we had the first home loan deposit scheme coming out so there were lots of people in the market um, looking to buy maybe not the same amount of stock that they actually could buy um, and over the sort of you know six week period of, of lockdown that sort of things maybe slowed a little bit obviously with mortgages there's a sort of two to three month um, period between actual people buying their homes and, and settling the loans moving in. And I wonder, you know, looking at sort of smart lines data, what sort of things they've been seeing, what sort of trends they've been seeing over the period of COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it, the, the, there's a lag effect. And, and so when I, I had a look at some smart line data, they send me a, a bit of a pack every every Monday to have a look at what's happening. And uh, it has looked largely business as usual. You know, we haven't seen a huge drop off in mortgages. Um, there's still uh, activity occurring, which, you know, which is very pro positive. Uh, I guess interesting Interestingly, a lot of refinancing has, has been taking place. So uh, people taking advantage of the fact we've got these record low interest rates and banks are open for business and they're offering great deals. So, you know, if you are fully employed, it's, um, you are in a very different, different place. I think in terms of um, buyer activity, we can, we can certainly see that buyers are out there and, um, and that 
is being not being matched by properties for sale. Mm. So we're seeing very, very high levels of search on our side at the moment, which surprised me. You know, I don't re didn't really expect to see so many people out there looking to buy. Uh, we're seeing high levels of inquiry as well. So again, that was something, you know, I thought, oh, well, maybe people are searching because they're bored at home and yeah. got a lot of time, but you know, they are inquiring as well. So that's a really good sign. But we've got this incredible drop off in properties for sale. So another thing that seems to be happening is that people are applying for finance, getting pre-approval, but it taking longer to convert to a loan because they can't find a property. So, you know, I think this will be the key for now. And, and what, we, and one of the, and that is, you know, really one of the factors that seems to be holding up pricing. If we have a look at what happened to prices across Australia in April, uh, you know, there was a lot of doom and gloom predictions about 30% price crashes, but, you know, in, in Sydney, prices crept up a little bit. So that, that imbalance between supply and demand does seem to be stabilising the property market quite a bit. Um, but it's not to say things won't get worse. You know, we don't know for sure exactly what will happen with these very, very high levels of unemployment. But uh, I think what's help helping with distress in, in amongst homeowners is the six month mortgage freezes, very low interest rates, the stimulus, you know, there's all these things that are really helping people at the moment, which isn't leading to the, the catastrophic conditions in the property market that we otherwise would have seen if, if all those things weren't available. Yeah, for sure. And I know that so many brokers have been working their socks off trying to help all these customers get access to these packages and explaining what the six month holiday really means for them and how that's going to impact their mortgage. Um, I wondered as well, just looking at the sort of the environment at the moment and, and moving forward, do you expect the role of the broker to change um, following COVID-19 or do you think it will be pretty much business as usual? Uh, no, look, I think, look, I'd say at the moment, like you said, I'd, I'd imagine a lot of them are very busy and a lot of busy brokers, refinancing, dealing with people that are starting to feel quite stressed about their financial system. So, so you know, I think that's a, um, that's going to probably continue for quite some time. Uh, I do think, I mean, it's been interesting that the banking sector in general, the, the focus after the Royal Commission um, was surprisingly on brokers, which, you know, did seem very unfair at the time, I think, to a lot of brokers. And for, to me personally, you know, I found it quite surprising that you go through this massive Royal Commission and suddenly brokers are an issue. It seemed, it seemed quite strange. So I think that focus on um, on brokers will probably be removed a lot more than, than it may have otherwise have done if we hadn't have gone through COVID-19. Um, but also, I guess the role of the broker is going to be continue to be very, very important that people do need help going through the home loan process. And even if they don't need help and they can do it themselves, it's such a great, great um, offering. And, you know, personally, I'm going through a knockdown rebuild at the moment and having to get refinanced for that and understanding how construction loans work and understanding how, you know, not even, the information available that you have to provide, you know, like, you know, on one hand, you've got to provide all your details on your, your expenses and your, pay, um, your income. But then with a construction loan, there's a lot of other information that you need to provide. So um, it's been great for me having a mortgage, mortgage broker because obviously I could go online and work it out, but it just really short cuts that process that, you know, this is one thing I don't need to work out and it's actually being paid for ultimately by the bank. And, you know, for me, it's no, it's no cost. So, yeah. you know, for me, it's been such a great process. Yeah, and particularly, as you say, for something like construction finance, where you have all these other sort of ho hoops and hurdles to jump through, having someone there to actually walk you through and know what they're doing, I think, could be a bit of a comfort. I know at least I would I would find it that way. Um, I also just want to ask you a little bit around what you sort of envisage happening moving forward, given the fact that obviously we've been seeing so many people move to digital tech and um, understanding more how digital solutions can help us um, deliver things more efficiently and more quickly. And I know that Smartline obviously offers a lot of um, tools and platforms for its brokers to try and help them write loans remotely, especially during COVID-19. I wonder, do you think as a general trend, we'll see everyone pretty much move to a much more sort of accepting digital technology in their day-to-day -day lives more frequently. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was always happening. You know, we, we could see that people were more, more likely to interact online. Things like Zoom calls were already happening. You know, we were trying to, a lot of companies were trying to avoid people traveling interstate all the time. So Zoom calls were really happening. Uh, a lot of companies doing some very good online um, offering, you know, and I think that that was something that, you know, shortcutting processes for them and just, you know, simple things that people could do themselves as opposed to having 
need to get on the phone and, and get some help. So it was, was all already shifting. I think what COVID has done though is it has just accelerated that. That you know we can see that um, you know a good example are digital inspections on on realestate.com.au that um, to be able to go onto our site and get a video walkthrough of a property suddenly makes searching for property a lot easier because you don't have to visit every property. You can just look at ten properties one night, you know, go through each of them and then shortlist at that stage. So, you know, that's one example that we've found enormous levels of interest and huge amounts of video downloads and, and views. And, you know, so I think that will change. I think some things will go back to normal, you know, digital auctions, I don't think, are, you know, I think they're a poor substitute for, for live auctions, for example. So I know in New South Wales, you know, live auctions are back and I don't really think we'll see the same level of digital auctions taking place. So, you know, there will be changes and even the way places that people live, I mean, if you have to be in Sydney, for example, and Sydney's such an expensive city because your job's in Sydney, but then your employer says, well, you can actually work 100% from home if you, you know, if you like, or maybe they'll even make you work from home, then that does open up the opportunity to live in regional areas or to live elsewhere in Australia. So I think, you know, there's, there's kind of these short term issues about, you know, getting back to work and, you know, dealing with not social distancing and, and, the, and the like. But then I think there's these longer term issues that will also drive Australia in that, that you know, we, we don't have to be so wedded to our city that we work in. We can potentially work anywhere. Yeah, maybe see a bit more of a sort of spread to, to the regions, as you say, and as long as their internet can cope with yes, it. <laughs> right. I know I'm having internet problems at the moment. <laughs> so. <laughs> so I just wondered as well, like looking at the um, different industries that are, that are out there, and we know obviously the hospitality sector in the tourism sector have been very badly hit by COVID. Are there any sectors that are particularly booming at the moment? Government. <laughs> so um, it's quite, it's really interesting to look at Canberra at the moment on our site. We can see that rents are well up, um, rental listings are well down, we've got very high levels of search, we've got very high levels of inquiry and it's not surprising, I mean Canberra is 42% government um, employment um, but then if you go beyond that most people are employed in sectors that support government. So. Um, the tax office needs more people, Centrelink needs more people, Department of Health needs more people. So there's this incredible employment boom in the government sector, which is incredibly unusual. You know, we don't typically see that. So Canberra's doing really, really well. Um, we're seeing first home buyer activity pretty good, um, which is, um, it's, I mean, it seems surprising, but I don't, it, it's not really. I mean, one of the things we can see that first home buyers don't like fast moving markets. And so when they're in fast moving markets, they, they, t they seem to pull back a little bit en masse. Uh, they don't like investors. Investors and first home buyers do tend to, to, to um, target <laughs> similar properties. So, so that's a good thing for them. Uh, and then also all the grants available to them, the state grants um, that, that are available are really helpful. The 5% deposit scheme is, is another really good one for first home buyers. So, you know, there's a lot helping first home buyers. Um, and then conversely, investors aren't, we're just not seeing much activity from them at the moment. They, they really seem to be drawing back and um, they're certainly not, in, they're not searching like they used to, they're not inquiring. Um, they were starting to come back in um, February, March. Um, they, they kind of disappeared during the, the Financial Services Royal Commission. But yeah, this has really pulled them back again. So I think they're worried about things like the six month ban on evictions, dropping rental rates. You know, there's a lot that's really worrying investors at the moment. They'll be back, but you know, I think it's just a period of adjustment for now. So for a broker, maybe thinking about which particular area they should be really heavily marketing to, it sounds like a first home buyer in Canberra is the really <laughs> the sweet spot there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, first home by inquiry doubled in between March and April. So, you know, this just incredible. Like, as, you know, I wouldn't have expected in this environment to see that sort of doubling of inquiry. But yeah, Canberra's really good. I mean, and then you go around the um, capital cities. I mean, premium Melbourne and Sydney seems to be holding up. I think a lot of people looking for bargains. Um, you know, seeing the, the, those areas of safe havens, you know, if you're going to park your money somewhere, those areas are perceived to hold value better. So, you know, I think, you know, if you go around Australia, there's certainly pockets that are, are doing pretty well considering. And then there's other areas which, you know, primarily areas that are related to tourism or investors or um, foreign students, you know, they're the, they're the areas that are, are struggling. So aside from um, government, are there any other industries that are particularly doing well during this sort of crisis? Yeah, mining's doing well. So um, we, we have, we've seen, so 80% of Australians' mineral exports are in gold, coal and iron ore. And iron ore prices held 
pretty high. We're seeing we're going to see a record level of iron ore exports. Or it's actually the highest level of exports Australia's ever made in in, in the June financial year. So um, it'll hit $100 billion. So iron ore is doing really well. Um, gold is doing well, seen as the ultimate safe haven. I mean, we all think property is safe, but you know, a lot of people feel gold is you know, far more safer. So we're seeing a lot of money going to gold and next year we'll be the biggest gold producer in, a, in the world. So uh, very good for the WA economy and, and should be good for Perth too. So um, Perth is a little bit of a wild card for me because I'm, I'm, I, we, we have seen Perth struggle for a long time now, you know, pretty much since the mining boom finished. But you know, with what's happening with the, um, the mining sector at the moment, it's probably the most positive news after government at, in, at this stage. Oh, well, that sounds great. And thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today, Narita. And but thank you very much as well for giving us sort of some, I think, optimism as well. Thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.